Hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon, and thank you all for attending today. Um, I hear we have a really great crowd of about 120 people, so thank you again. Uh, thank you, BHBA, for having us. Um, our panel today is called Utilizing Data Analysis in the New Film and TV Landscape. We're going to speak about the somewhat recent disruption due to the significant prevalence of streaming and related party integration, really how that impacts profit participants and investors, as well as finance and production companies. And we're also going to speak a lot about how to utilize data analysis and KPIs to identify possible issues, attempt to quantify them if we can, and especially kind of connect that to any possible legal matters or litigation or similar. Um, thank you to the rest of the panel. Um, I'll quickly introduce myself and then each of you can kind of uh, take a minute or two and introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Mike Sipple. I'm a principal at gh and I've been doing this for about 15 years now, um, primarily in the profit participation audit world, um, kind of leading or co-leading the Fox or Warner Brothers studios. And in the last five years, I've been really heavily focused on litigation support, um, expert witness, damages calculations. I had the privilege of being one of the experts in the Bones litigation. And I'm also doing a lot of valuations, um, both for formal reasons, like estate tax purposes and informal um, with like potential buyout offers. Um, so that's kind of my intro. Uh, I'll send it over to Viviana. You wanna go? Yeah, thank you, Mike. Thank you for having me, GHJ. I really appreciate the opportunity. My name is Viviana Zaragoitia. I'm vice president at TPC. We're a boutique lender in the film and TV space, financing distribution contracts, and tax incentives, both domestically and abroad. Um, aside from lending, we're also specialized in advisory work on tax credits, post-production accounting, and brokerage of transferable credits. So we built out our expertise from tax credit lending to our other verticals. Um, I have been in the entertainment industry my entire career, almost 20 years now. I started as a production accountant at New Image Films and also worked at Bold Films and segued into finance at Lionsgate prior to joining TPC nine years ago. Awesome. Seth, you wanna go next? <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, and uh, hi everyone, I'm Seth Brody, uh, CFO of Anonymous Content. And yeah, just wanna thank Beverly Hills Bar Association and Greenhouse and Jenks for, for having me. Uh, I've been at Anonymous Content for the past uh, year and a half. And for those of you who don't know Anonymous, uh, the company was founded in 1999 by Steve Golan and has three primary divisions. Uh, first division is film and TV production and finance where we've produced uh, such content as The Revenant and True Detective. Uh, we have a, our second division is a commercial division where we produce around hundred commercials a year. And lastly, we have a significant talent management business where we represent around a thousand writers, actors, directors, and authors. Uh, prior to Anonymous, I was Senior Vice President at Legendary, running their finance division and played a key role in M&A and corporate strategy. And prior to that, I was at uh, DreamWorks Studios as Vice President of Finance. And prior to that, I have my background uh, in investment banking where I worked on Wall Street for almost four years working in M&A at Lazard and leverage finance at Oppenheimer. I just want to give a special shout out to uh, members of the Anonymous content legal team for uh, joining today. And I'll pass it over to Peter. Thanks, Seth. Uh, I'm Peter Class, partner at GHJ's Films Entertainment Practice. I'm honored to be part of BHBA's thought leadership tradition. A little bit about GHJ. We are a boutique accounting and advisory firm. Um, my career has focused on helping stakeholders in film and TV with achieving results in profit sharing arrangements and dispute resolution. Our clients range from talent to producers, financiers, rights holders. And historically, uh, as Mike mentioned, our focus has been profit participations, contract compliance audits at every major studio and niche distributor. I've worked with uh, and collaborated with both Seth and Viviana throughout my career. Uh, however, in the last several years, we have expanded to advising on film waterfall projections, term deal comparisons, an estimated fair market, fair market value of related party transactions. Uh, and this is why we're here. We're going to be highlighting the importance of data in today's presentation. 
Uh, prior to GHJ, my background was at Sony Pictures, uh, also doing uh, ultimates, uh, profit sharing uh, arrangements, audits, and modeling out. So I'm looking forward to today's panel. And uh, as a warm up question uh, to the group, we're going to start off with how is the new vertically integrated streaming world impacting your work? Uh, Viviana, why don't you kick us off? Sure. So prior to the pandemic, we were sort of one piece of the financing puzzle, uh, mostly specializing on tax incentive financing. Um, I would say post pandemic with the proliferation of pre-sales and so many streamers uh, pre-buying uh, content, we are now fully debt financing a lot of films. And these are films within the 5 million budget range and below uh, because they're able to, based on the talent, which drives most of these pre-sales, they're able to attach uh, distribution ahead of time, be it a worldwide sale to a streamer or divide it up between a domestic deal and foreign sales and then filming somewhere with a tax incentive, um, they're able to make these budgets with all of the collateral that we take on and then cash flow the whole film. So for us, it's helped our business in the sense that we're able to diversify what we do um, and also have a more volume of, of business. Now, the one caveat to this is that these films that are getting pre-sales are very much driven, I think, by statistics of what the streamers seem to get eyeballs uh, with their membership. Um, it's very much a certain talent, certain genre, um, action, horror, thriller, and there are certain talent that, that just drive these pre-sales immensely. So it has to be, it's, it's a very formulaic way, uh, which is affecting the content that is being made in terms of streamers, uh, which we'll discuss later um, as well. But <clears throat> it's really increased our business in terms of its volume significantly. Uh, how about you, Seth? Yeah, a, a few considerations on how vertically integrated uh, streamers have affected us. Um, I'd say first, uh, it's definitely created an increased uh, amount of optionality uh, with the with the tremendous amount of content buyers, and with that comes an increased variety of deals, whether it be a buyout, uh, a cost plus buyout, shorter term license deals, AVOD deals, uh, releasing theatrically, and. With all of that comes the need to re-examine uh, how value is generated from each window at each of these integrated players. And this has all led to an increased amount of modeling uh, to figure out the most profitable path for each project. Another consideration uh, of how vertically integrated, uh, how these vertically integrated players have impacted us um, is that in some ways for independence, it's definitely created a misalignment of interests. Uh, whereas on the film side, historically, both like the independent producer and the film distributor were solely motivated to increase box office revenues, uh, home video revenues and TV revenues. Now, now the distributor, <coughs> all, the distribu all the major distributors except for Sony have their own streaming platform uh, where they have a new stream of revenue, which is subscription revenue. And that, uh, that stream of revenue is uh, not re necessarily rewarded to the independent producer and, doesn't, and the independent producer doesn't necessarily get a taste of that revenue over the long period of time uh, that someone is a subscriber. So definitely, I think, creates this, uh, a misalignment of interest. And uh, say the last piece is that information uh, on comparable pieces of content has become harder to come by uh, to really know if you're getting a good deal. Historically, uh, at least in the film business, uh, sites like Box Office Mojo or Variety that publish box office information uh, were great sources of comparable information. Uh, but with, uh, with box office down around 30% uh, since 2019 and the number of movies being released this year is down around 36%. Uh, versus pre-pandemic mm -hmm. times, uh, information has definitely become harder uh, to come by as content is being sold directly to streamers or going direct to platform and private deals, uh, which is making finding those comparables uh, 
much more difficult, but I would say it's still not impossible to find those comparables. Um, and then given all that uh, and being a finance professional uh, on my end, uh, it really just comes back to corporate finance principles, which you'll hear me harp on uh, a few times today. Uh, and those principles being the net, just looking at the net present value of all the cash flows on a given project and determining from those cash flows <clears throat> if the project is a go or no go uh, situation. And with that comes looking at like the quality of the revenues, such that how many, how much of the revenues are contracted versus non-contracted, and uh, and other similar variables. Pass it back to you, Peter or Michael. You want to go, Peter? Uh, sure. Uh, so something interesting you said, uh, Seth, that caught my attention is that there is no box office mojo equivalent for streamers. And the term I have heard thrown around in the past year is walled gardens, uh, meaning that the streaming services do guard their data. Uh, within the last year or so, they've started releasing what is the top 10. There are some private uh, research platforms that do uh, Nielsen and uh, Plum Research that do some sort of uh, sampling of how the, how the streaming services are playing, let's say the number of hours, the number of subscribers that are watching it, but it's not actual data. It, these are estimates at best. And the biggest change in my world have been uh, the client and stakeholders concerns over profit sharing. <clears throat> and the studio and the stakeholder interest uh, don't seem aligned anymore, even more so than before. Uh, when there's fewer and fewer comparable arm's length transactions in the marketplace, uh, self-dealing has become the norm. And the question I hear more and more from talent or producers is what can I expect when there is no transparency from the distribution partners in terms of strategy or in term terms of value I can see? Uh, so we are certainly much more involved than historically, and sometimes at the deal-making stage, assisting attorneys with deciphering the ever-changing profit definitions. And Mike, I think you can build on that. Yeah, so in the profit participation world, in the litigation support world, it's, it's, it's been a major issue. The kind of related party dealings, uh, affiliated transactions, you, you've heard all these terms vertical integration, this has been an issue for, for many years um, before the pandemic, before even like Disney Plus came out. Um, it's really, I think what happened was was big with the Bones case and that was a big public, public case that kind of woke up everybody to what types of related party issues were happening. And I think what happened with, with me and Peter is that a lot of our clients um, rightfully so, we're very concerned that this was also happening to them. You know, the same thing that happened on Bones was happening to them. And I think it, it, it impacted our audits a lot. Um, you know, we really focused a lot on related party dealings. We were doing a, a lot more analyses on whether, you know, this, it, 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 this is fair, mark, fair market value or not. Um, we ended up with more audit claims, some of them being more material than, than you know, they used to be. Um, we've seen the settlement process even take a little bit longer. Um, and, and sometimes because these issues are so material, um, you know, we have them even going to a mediation or an arbitration. So it's definitely been a, a huge issue, I think, in the last five years. I think every single year it's gotten bigger and bigger and bigger, certainly with, you know, Disney Plus and HBO Max. Um, COVID happening, all the day and date stuff. It's just been like every year has been a, a, a kind of a, a higher level of this issue that, that we've been seeing for the last five years. Um, we'll talk about it more, but obviously the day and date issues with like the Scarlett Johansson and Black Widow, as well as kind of the current one that's happening now with Village Roadshow and HBO Max and kind of the Matrix Resurrections. Um, the other thing that we haven't talked about yet is, is I think with the, the impact of like Netflix, just for example, um, with their backend buyouts on profit participation and how that's starting to work its way into the traditional studio models. And um, some studios now are doing that. And I don't know if they're all gonna start doing that or it will end up reverting back to the traditional model, um, but that's definitely kind of been a, an impact in our world as well. 
Anything else on this or let's go to, you wanna to go to the next question? Yes, let's move on. So how does data analysis, trends, KPIs play a role in your work? Um, and do you have any examples and are there any specific le legal implications? Um, so now kind of focusing more on the data analysis, the KPIs. Um, Seth, you wanna take this one? Sure. Yes, in terms of uh, data analysis, uh, data has definitely become harder uh, to come by just as consumer habits have changed and the market has changed, uh, as Michael was just mentioning, um, more, more in, uh, figuring out information on arm's length transactions is harder to come by as there's more private dealings. Um, and all of that uh, is, is just driven by the number of movies is decreasing and that are, that's going through box office. Therefore, we're less reliant on box office, uh, box office mojo, which traditionally had very public figures on that website. Um, but there's still a lot of uh, good comparable information that's harder to come by, but it's written about in articles and can be discovered through private conversations. And Greenhouse and Jenks has a fantastic database as well from all of their audit work uh, just across the industry to, to figure to figure out uh, uh, comparables. And comparables from my perspective are super important as those comparables set the goalposts um, and set the goalposts for a new piece of content. Uh, and those goalposts help drive predictable modeling outcomes, um, especially in a very high risk industry. So, and that, that's what we strive for on the finance side is looking at comparables, figuring out if it's a fair set. And uh, ideally that helps drive a, a predictable, model out, predictable model outcomes. In terms of KPIs, uh, I still uh, heavily rely on just traditional uh, corporate finance and traditional uh, Hollywood KPIs, which are uh, the net present value, which is the discounted cash flows of all uh, future cash flows of a project. Uh, yeah, so that's the first KPI. The second KPI is the IRR, which is the return, which is the rate of return of those cash flows. Uh, the third KPI, which is a traditional Hollywood metric, uh, is cash on cash, which is total cash in uh, versus total cash, total cash in, uh, such as revenues from theatrical, home video, TV versus uh, total cash out, including the advertising cost uh, and the cost of the budget, uh, which is a, a traditionally a comparable metric across uh, studios. Then the last, uh, the fourth KPI I focus on is nominal cash, which is just the total amount of dollars not discounted uh, that a certain project has brought in. And so you'll see some of these uh, in the presentation Michael and uh, Peter will make later, especially focus on uh, cash on cash. I think for us, um, just to sort of bring it together on the creative is that we sort of sit in the middle between the financial and the creative, where it seems that with certain attachments, it drives streamers to get you a certain number of a minimum guarantee. But obviously we don't have insight into what metrics they're using. And I don't think anyone does at this point as to how certain attachments drive it a, the number a certain way or how that number is even quantified by a lot of these distributors. So I think it's on the creative side for a lot of our clients as they're trying to put projects together, they're having to balance uh, creative decision-making but also the financial implications of who they are attaching to certain projects and what type of film they are even making because that's what's gonna drive their ability to get the project financed from the get-go, right? So if they're making a certain type of genre or a project with certain attachments, it's going to basically lead the distributors to put a, a number on that, a value on that. Um, but I think at this point, it's very difficult to know how um, the streamers are quantifying the top 10, how they're measuring it, um, but also how that, what that means for them as well in terms of retaining membership or earnings to all of their parent companies as well. So it's been an interesting uh, past couple of years with the proliferation of the new streaming services and the proliferation of pre-buys because um, it, it's affecting the, the sort of model 
for how to creatively make these films and also make them for a budget that is going to make sense. Yeah. Peter? Yeah, so Seth, Seth alluded to our database that we have of uh, film projects. And I will just uh, give everybody uh, a little bit of a background about this and share a couple slides. Uh, so the catalyst of, of our film study really was to have more reference points uh, for our participation audits, especially as the industry was becoming more ver vertically integrated and market data has become less readily available. And we wanted to be better armed with historical baselines, especially when evaluating affiliated transactions. Um, during uh, early 2020, uh, when the world shut down and uh, most of the studios uh, put our audits on pause, if you will, uh, with some it was maybe a three month, six month turnaround, with others it was a bit longer. Uh, we had more availability with our staff and we embarked on um, a massive database project where we took hundreds of films as, uh, from the last decade spanning in we categorize them and standardize the data in such a way where we can have a benchmark comparables uh, among uh, like, like films uh, divided by budgets, uh, territories, media, yeah, even genres at some point. And I'd like to share a few teaser slides with you uh, due to confidentiality reasons. Uh, these are going to be the most summarized, uh, more of the general slides. I will not be able to go into uh, uh, carving out the details and drilling down as much as I would like to, uh, but I'm hoping this will give you uh, a sort of a bite-sized view into what type of data we have and how we've been using it. So bear with me as I will share the screen. And my colleagues, Mike, uh, do you see the KPI? Yes, sir. All right, so uh, I'm gonna share a few KPIs uh, mm -hmm. in terms of data. And again, we used uh, films spanning from the last decade that have at least five years in distribution. So this is really from a distributor's point of view. These are ultimate receipts and expenses and Yes, this is historical information, and we'll talk about how it's, gonna, it's been adjusted because we keep updating the database even through the pandemic, so it is a living document, and we will have a baseline of data by, by years of release. Uh, but the key point here is how much, how much has the revenue pie differs between domestic and international, and how has it changed over the years? Uh, so this is, again, historical data. Uh, this is from films that were released uh, between 2012 and 2016. So at least five years in release to be counted towards our ultimate analysis. And as you can see, uh, theatrical is, is fairly standard, but where it differs uh, between uh, domestic and international is really on the home video front, especially on physical data. International these days, uh, it's even a lot more uh, binary, whereas you only have the theatrical market and really the streaming uh, television market. And when I mean television, it also includes AVOD and SVOD. There is no windows. Since the windows have collapsed, it's all in one market. It's fully uh, a replacement technology, uh, despite how the studios are reporting to profit participants. Uh, another interesting uh, part is that uh, physical, uh, physical goods are, despite everything that's been said in the media, and none of you may have even purchased a DVD in the last two, three, four, or five years, uh, they still continue to sell and be a big uh, chunk in uh, media revenues. Uh, of, of course, this data has changed uh, since the pandemic, and the physical goods continue to collapse, whereas SVOD and television continue to rise. And we'll share another slide. 
And here is another uh, KPI that Mike and I use a lot in, when it comes to reverse engineering ultimates. And these are revenue to box office conversion rates. So basically, it, it, one can take, if the movie has $100 million in domestic box office, you can predict with, with a fair point of accuracy the ultimate revenues uh, for, the, for the film in the ultimate life cycle, say between seven and 10 years. Mm. Uh, of course, this is just a very summarized and generic model. We could, within our database, we can break it out by budget. So obviously the figures look a little bit different when we're talking about micro budgets of films that are less than $15 million or large tent poles with budgets over 100. And what, what's an interesting statistic here is how you can see is uh, the difference between the conversion rates between domestic and international. Um, it's a much uh, lower film rental rate. Uh, so when you're looking at the box office and you're looking at box office mojo, uh, the rule of thumb is domestic is going to be at 50%. And that's what you can expect to be uh, shown in your accountings, whereas the international may be less than 40% or even much lower if the film has been distributed in China as China is typically 25% of the box office. Um, what's also interesting is the, is the rise in it, both TVOD and EST in the last five years and the collapse of the physical market uh, you don't see that in this graph because this is this is the, this is historical data, but in our uh, follow-up KPIs when we're looking at more recently issued films, uh, the DVD uh, physical goods model it really sh shows us that the international markets is in single digits and uh, covers around five percent. So that highlights really the collapse of that market. And the last slide I wanted to share here is the trend uh, from, uh, from films that have been released 10 years ago to films that have been released more like five or six years ago than you were. And this is the change in domestic uh, home entertainment. And you can see uh, how the split between home entertainment where it's dom dominated by physical goods about 10 years ago, where that was about three quarters, uh, five years ago, it was about half. And these days, although we have a smaller sample size, uh, it appears to be about a quarter. So with this type of data, uh, what we can do is not only look at fair market comps, but historical comps, as well as re-engineer ultimates and to test for reasonability. And Mike, I'll pass it on to you. You've done a similar study uh, in television. Yeah, um, it was really um, a nearly identical study. Um, television is generally harder to come across. There, there are We likely do fewer audits in television than we do in theatrical, but we did end up getting a really large database of about 160 different titles. Um, these are all different types, old, new, network, pay, basic cable, straight to SVOD, 30 minutes, 60 minutes, um, really every different type of TV show. And, and we really just crunched them all into one big massive Excel file and, and ran all sorts of different KPIs just based on so many different factors by studio, whether they were related party or not. Again, old, new, network pay. Um, and we, we have probably this Excel file that I'm talking about probably has 50 different tabs. Um, it's loaded with different ways of looking at all sorts of different data, uh, all sorts of different KPIs. Um, I think the biggest kind of help for us um, outside of just being able to kind of identify red flags in the audit world um, is really that idea that we've been talking about with finding comps. And I think a lot of what, what we're referring to here is how do we determine what fair market value is um, in that context where now you've got a related party streamer or some sort of related party transaction and they're really paying themselves for their own product. 
how can we determine if that's a fair price? And I think the best way to do that is to find a third party comp. Um, so I think one of the big uh, kind of aha moments we had from this was looking at you know, some of the streaming licenses. So this would be for a series that started you know, on a network or pay or basic cable, and then was licensed to like a Netflix or Amazon or a Hulu. Um, we ended up looking at about 80 to 100 different TV series here. Um, and we ended up crunching all these numbers and coming up with what would be an average per year um, per episode amount. And again, part of the difficulty with TV versus a movie is there are so many different variables about how many seasons did it go? Um, when did it start? You know, did it, did it start in, in 2000 or 2010? Um, and to trying to kind of be able to crunch all of that um, accurately to kind of make apples and apples out of all of it so we can make good comparisons. Um, I can't put it up on the screen due to some of the confidentiality reasons that Peter mentioned, but I wanted to just rattle off some numbers here um, as far as an average per year per episode amount. Um, this is again what Netflix, Amazon, and Hulu are paying the studios to license these, these TV shows. Um, if you look at all of the product, again, this is in the last 10 years, so we're not going back to, to 2000, but just the last 10 years, um, the Netflix range was approximately 70 to 110,000. And that's not, that's not the low is 70 and the high is 110. That's kind of just a, a, a spread on the average, if you will. Um, there are some that go as low as a couple thousand and some that are, you know, two, 300,000. Um, so this is just kind of a range to give you an idea um, Amazon was about 35 to 55,000 and Hulu was about 20 to 35,000. And really that kind of is, is probably what you might have all guessed. Netflix is generally pays the most. Amazon in the, is in the middle and Hulu, at least um, a couple of years ago, they were on the lower end. Um, most of this based on, on eyeballs, I think, and subscribers. Um, if you kind of change this analysis to look at more current season so maybe in the last five years as opposed to the last 10 years these numbers do go up um, quite significantly um, about 50 to 75 percent of the numbers that i that i previously mentioned to you i can tell you this this tv guide analysis that we did has been instrumental in a lot of the work um, that we've been doing whether it be in the audit world or litigation or or valuation um, it's been a really good starting point when a client has a question of about, you know, hey, Hulu gave us, you know, $20,000 per year per episode for this series. It, is that a fair amount? And we can use kind of our, our comp and our database to, to, find, to find, you know, five to 10 really good comparables and, and say, you know, actually, yeah, that seems okay. It's about right in the middle or, you know, no, that's way too low. Um, you know, you should pursue this kind of type of thing. Um, obviously, the data itself is confidential, so it, none of the specifics can be released at all. Um, but it's a good starting point to kind of, first of all, determine if there is a possible issue, and then to potentially quantify how how big is it. You know, is it is it worth getting into a uh, litigation over? Is it a hundred thousand dollar issue or a five million dollar issue? Um, so it's been extremely helpful. Um, to Peter's film guide, I've, I've had several engagements that have required us to kind of analyze whether how much a movie that hasn't even been made or hasn't been released yet is, is going to potentially make. And that, that can obviously be, be very difficult. Once a movie get, comes out and it has a couple of years of activity, projecting it to the future is much easier. There's kind of the conversion rates that, that Peter mentioned um, but when you have a movie that hasn't even been released, there can be some significant struggles there. Um, I've had to do several engagements where, you know, you look at as many comps as you can try to find, okay, here's a good estimate for what this movie would make in the box office. And then use our database with the conversion rates that Peter mentioned, use our, our ratios of expenses to revenues and to really have a decent shot of coming you know close to a good guess at how much this movie would make um so it's, it's been it's been really helpful for us um very very helpful in the valuation world and the litigation support world 
Um, and we, um, it, it's, really, it's really been a great tool for us. Thanks, Mike. I want to switch to modeling a bit. Uh, I love modeling, especially when it comes to film and television, because no one has a crystal ball how well a film will do. No film insider, Wall Street insider, hedge fund manager. No one knows how a movie will do because basically the, it's not a commoditized industry. Who, who, who knows how it will perform? All we have is comps and then we can run and then you have a deal. And based on that deal, we can model out what the ultimate uh, uh, revenues and expenses will be and ultimately the profits. And as Seth was alluding to cash on cash, Yes, we do have run those analysis. I didn't want to put that up. It is somewhat of a depressing statistics as when, when you factor in the film financing cost, distribution fees, uh, third-party profit participations, majority of films do not make money. Uh, not to discourage you, anyone, uh, this is just a very rewarding and sexy industry. Uh, but when it comes to modeling out scenarios for producers, whether it's going to be a traditional theatrical release or a streaming, uh, a streaming sale, buyout sale, um, the rule of thumb is, well, with a streamer, you're at least hitting a single, but your upside is limited. And with a theatrical release, yes, you can hit a home run or with a traditional television release. So it's really a risk versus reward calculation. And I wanted to kick this question over to Seth, is how has modeling been adjusted uh, for collapsing of windows, date and date releases? And in your experience, how do you handle the third party, related party sales in this new age of streaming? Well, definitely a spot on Peter that there is no crystal ball in this industry that uh, and we all wish there was given uh, the high risk nature of the industry. Um, but I would say at a, at a high level uh, in regards to windows collapsing, um, windows have been collapsing for the past 30 years uh, and just in an effort to accelerate cash flows and leverage the, uh, the PNA, which is the Princeton advertising spend for theatrical releases to, to really accelerate the cash flows uh, for downstream and downstream uh, windows. For example, uh, home video around like 30 years ago was around nine, occurred nine months after theatrical release, then it came down to six months and three months, and now it's even sooner. And uh, so this, this concept of collapsing, while it's uh, taking a lot of headlines, it's definitely uh, it's been in the headlines for for uh, for the past many years. In terms of day and date, for, for those of you who don't know what uh, what Peter was referring to, is when content comes out around the world on the same day uh, theatrically, so around the whole world on the same day, uh, or on streaming uh, the same day. And that concept uh, of day and date has been around for <clears throat> at least ten plus years. Uh, and really came around for two factors, uh, or, or two high-level factors. One was to prevent uh, piracy uh, of content, uh, and the second one was to create uh, just more of a, really utilize the advertising dollars to create a global uh, buzzworthy event. So yeah, given all of that, uh, from, from my perspective, models have definitely changed, and the ratio, uh, some of the one, one key ratio that I like to look at is the customer acquisition cost uh, divided by the lifetime value of the customer. And so when looking historically, uh, say a studio would spend around $5 uh, as the acquisition cost to get a customer into the theaters. And that customer then spends a ticket, uh, gets a movie ticket, plus maybe a DVD and some merchandise down the road. So say all the total revenue say is like 20, 20 or $25. So now you have the acquisition cost and the, and the lifetime value of that, uh, of that customer. And now in today's world, the market has definitely changed. When you think about Netflix's model, they're willing to spend probably in the likes of $100 or even, or even more. I don't have the exact numbers to acquire a customer because that lifetime value of the customer 
could be in the range of $500 to $2,000 plus, depending on how long that subscriber, uh, how long that person stays as a subscriber. So the models have definitely, uh, the model has definitely changed um, over, over time and in real time right now. Uh, one, uh, yeah, and then, so just going back to the question again uh, of how modeling has been adjusted for Windows and for day and date releases, when I look at a full PNL, uh, and after speaking with colleagues at major studios, uh, we all agree that the total pie of revenues has increased, but at the same time, the cost of production has increased due to uh, mainly two factors, COVID costs and the cost of inflation. And so, and, and the cost to advertise has also increased. So thereby with the, with the revenues increasing and the costs increasing, costs or profits have kind of stayed flat to slightly increasing uh, from my perspective. Uh, and, and when looking at um, this Windows again and how Windows have collapsed, I think while a lot of the headlines have been focused on the theatrical window shortening, one of the key windows that folks, I think, and analysts need to focus more on uh, and what I focus on a lot is the pay one, the, your traditional pay TV uh, windows, which include your pay one window and your pay two window, as these are very lucrative windows uh, and those windows start to dig into the concept of subscription revenue and overall lifetime value revenue that the streamers are gaining uh, that independents uh, definitely want a taste of. Um, but yeah, all, all that said, uh, I still, uh, when looking at total, uh, when looking at all modeling for Windows collapsing and day and date releases, I still come back to the basic corporate finance principles, which I think hold up very strong in, uh, in this industry and really focusing on two aspects. One, do I have a fair set of comparables? Uh, meaning say 50% of the comparables are profitable, 50% are not profitable to really determine like if my content performs as average, does that mean the net present value, which is the, which is the other KPI is still positive? Uh, and so those, those are kind of the two things that I tend to focus on uh, a lot when looking at uh, windows collapsing and on uh, to stay in day releases. Yeah, I think so, to that point. Oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say that that uh, subscriber, Netflix subscriber uh, example was really illuminating. Uh, I was going to come back to you, Viviana, but I'll go ahead. I love a free flowing conversation. Sure. I, I just think in general, the comps are going to be very difficult until the dust settles in our industry uh, in terms of streamers and also how they value content. I mean, I think a lot of streamers in terms of their in-house productions seem to be overpaying um, with very high budgets. And even though uh, they don't share the information as to how that equates to uh, whether it's membership or how they, how they quantify a successful film, is it just because it's in the top 10? Is it because it gets awards? There's different metrics. Um, but I think, I imagine ultimates from three to five years ago are already outdated. And so trying to model today for two to four years ahead is going to be very difficult uh, because our industry right now is in such upheaval in terms of streamers perhaps um, consolidating um, the value of content, changing the type of content uh, that is gonna drive, that is being driven by subscriber bases, uh, the theatrical, the windows collapsing as Seth mentioned, um, theatrical is really struggling to come back um, and it's not just the theaters themselves, but it's also driven by us um, who most people don't seem to be going back either. Um, so I, I, I think it's gonna be difficult to figure out a, a way to um, model out and also project with the cons constantly ever-changing landscape of streamers and sort of the taste, not only creatively, but also in terms of budgets and not only in-house productions versus acquisitions. And, and Viviana, to that point, if, if you would take out a crystal ball and as the streamers mature, will they be sharing more KPIs with the stakeholders? And uh, you're, in, you're in the world of independent film financing. 
are you finding that uh, pumps are more readily available for streaming sales uh, during the pandemic uh, or not? Uh, I would say not, but I think they will be forced to, I think, by the participants. Uh, I think that's the only thing that's gonna drive them sharing that information, um, as we've already seen with certain high profile cases. Uh, but I think it, it's, it's very much changed the landscape now, the proliferation of streamers. You used to go to the independent film space to make things outside of the studio system. However, now sort of any A-list talent can go to a streamer and say, I wanna make this. And a streamer is more than happy to bankroll that because they want to be in business with that person. And it also creates the exclusivity, which drives the membership, right? So you want a certain director, writer, or actor's film, uh, because that means that's gonna drive viewership and subscriptions over to your service. Um, so I think as they try, as each streamer tries to differentiate themselves and create niche markets within them as to who's gonna specialize on what type of content, uh, until that settles, it's gonna be uh, difficult, but for, for the independent world, you know, the budgets are going down, there's less foreign pre-sales because of the buying of, of worldwide rights. So it's hurting not only what you make a film for, because ultimately, as Seth was mentioning, you get your budget plus a premium, there's not much left for participants. And so part of the reason that we have seen an uptick in debt financing films uh, is because it's very difficult for equity to recoup uh, on these projects when you have uh, one sale or a couple of sales that make up the entire film, why would equity invest uh, when there's nowhere for them to recoup from? Um, so that in turn then affects the creative because you have you know, independent producers making films at a, at a bigger volume in order to make it a sustainable livelihood to collect a producer fee, move on to the next project. But it's a very formulaic, um, type of project that is being made based on what the demand from the streamer is. I think uh, in the past years, we had projects where let's say we made 30 films a year, about five to 10 of those would be your sort of art house darling that would go to a festival, get a big streamer sale um, and would go out for awards. Now there's much less of those because those are just mean, being made in house by the streamer. So the independent space is no longer needed to make what historically would they, would produce, which were sort of out of the box uh, creative projects. Um, now that's sort of being gobbled up by the streamers themselves, leaving the independent space to make um, lower tier films. Well, that, that, that's a fair point. And you've mentioned about, you mentioned streamers wanting to differentiate themselves in this competitive landscape. And actually this leads into our, one of the questions uh, is, can A plus talent demand that the streaming platforms open up the books to them or uh, provide some sort of methodology for upside, perhaps uh, awards bonuses or viewing bonuses? And really, this is a question to, uh, to the panel, uh, but anyone can take this. I'm not sure we know yet. Um, I, in the audit world, I don't think I've come across a really strong, you know, provision from a A-list talent to have Netflix open up their, you know, eyeballs and all CPMs, all all that kind of stuff. I think, I think they guard that stuff very, very close as we've as we've discussed. I know in the in the studio world, um, you know, they they do have to open up their books. Obviously, um, there are audit provisions and. Um, you know, you can really start digging into all of that. Um, I don't know, or certainly have not come across myself any specific agreements that force, you know, a Netflix or Amazon to, you know, release all of their, um, you know, closely guarded details. I would say I agree with Mike. I don't think it's there yet, but I think it's coming as the streamers try to differentiate themselves with the IP. So if there's a certain IP that is being uh, courted or that is highly valuable, then I think they may be forced to show their hand um, to the talent. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, and I think Netflix has started to open up the door uh, to this with their top 10 uh, films and top 10 uh, TV by country. So it get, it's starting to get pretty specific in terms of uh, number of views and, and hours. 
And I think uh, talent agencies are definitely likely to squeeze the streamers to increase the market value and quotes for their clients, um, which will open up the door for performance bonuses for hit content, um, yeah, as uh, Viviana and Michael were saying. I think it's interesting because the top tens, I mean, I think of a film like Gray Man, which had a high budget, how, how does Netflix measure whether that's a success or not? What metrics would they use? And then how does you know, the talent involved in that film go back to Netflix and say, well, we made this film that was top 10. We want to make another one. Uh, how, do, how do they negotiate in terms of uh, the leverage that they have to maybe ask for a bigger budget for the next one? I'd go, I would go back to Seth's point. Does it matter if it's the most eyeballs or has the film or a television event, uh, episodic event, driven new customers to that service? And how do you measure that value and share it with the talent? I mean, that, that's really the, the question. Yeah, I don't know. I'd certainly love to be a fly on the wall in the in negotiating rooms at Netflix. Um, just for one to kind of understand it, as far as the participation back in, like the buyout model, like what, what is the math? What is the formula behind that? Um, I don't know if that does have metrics based into it or if they're doing some sort of, hey, you know, a traditional model, this is what your movie would have made um, down this traditional line and we'll pay you off based on that. Um, again, kind of a, the closely guarded secrets. I, don't, I, I haven't seen any sort of, um, you know, backend model from Netflix. So I'm certainly, certainly curious how that's, how that's done. Yeah. That, that, that's yeah. a great point. How, how would you even, how would you even quantify what a film would have made if it would have come out theatrically when theatrical is also, it's so unstable right now. Yeah, I know. I feel like you have to kind of almost look at it pre, <laughs> pre pandemic and here's a good comp of here's what this made. And, um, but uh, certainly the COVID has changed a lot of that. And I'm not sure you know, when that will kind of get back to normal, I would say the, the back to normal phrase. Um, but just curious, like Top Gun, right? It was a very successful movie. I just wondered, you know, how, how different the modeling would have been to the back end, how much more box office it would have done if it was, you know, a 2019 release versus 2022. Um, I think Top Gun has done pretty well, Mike. <laughs> I know. It's, it I probably would have done even better. How much more <laughs> would it have done? You know, I'm not sure it would have done. I I I go to the Cineplex these days, and it's really just three tent poles that are playing. Um, the the art house films or really the the mid level films are kind of gone. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, what I mostly see in the theaters, I, I go quite often, is I see A24 releases, and then I see big blockbusters, and there doesn't seem to be anything in the middle. Now, I, I always love to stay positive on these things. I did read yesterday that movie pass is supposedly coming back. So it'll be interesting to see the new iteration and if that drives um, people back into theaters. I used to have it in this first iteration and it, I used to go all the time. Right. And, and to your question, Mike, about uh, we can all take out a crystal ball and you know play with a, what a reasonable methodology would be in valuing uh, the film's receipts uh, that goes to uh, day and date release, for example, goes on a streaming service and theatrical and how much theatrical is it losing? Is it perhaps you take a number of households, um, a factor of the number of households that have watched uh, the film within the first uh, mm -hmm. week, first two weeks? I mean, that could be a way to do it. I mean, this is just an evolving uh, matrix at this point. Yeah, yeah. We, I've, we've heard of lots of, there's a lot of different ways, I think, to kind of estimate um, and come up with all these different alternatives for um, that question that you just had, Peter. I, I think it was Jeff Cole who, who kind of had some of those, um, you know, per, per household analytics that were, maybe it was the last like um, UCLA entertainment law or one of, one of the symposiums recently, there was some, some sharing of, of numbers on that. And it was really, it was really interesting. Yeah, so just to tie it up from a independent uh, perspective, uh, it's definitely a mix of art and science as, as you were, as, as, uh, we were kind of alluding to from how much talent should get paid and 
one of the things that that uh, I've done uh, in my previous jobs and, and at Anonymous is we always create two models for every project, one theatrical, one streaming. Uh, and the theatrical one based on comps, looking at like how much someone would get paid in a uh, theatrical model and uh, tying it to uh, looking at um, a streaming deal as well and, and to really help justify uh, where we think uh, the right number is in terms of like back end and, and all in compensation. And so and it, it all comes down to comps, which have become harder to find. And uh, so it's definitely becoming a, definitely a mix of art and science. And that will close our discussion. And I want to thank uh, the panelists, Viviana, Seth, and Michael. Uh, thank you for joining us. And I wanted to move on to uh, the Q&A. I think we have a few minutes left. Yeah, so pop some questions in the Q&A section, or I don't know if you can um, just use your voice and do it, or if it has to go through the Q&A. But... Let us know if you have any questions. I see two questions out here uh, in the chat box. Uh, one we've already answered regarding the talent demanding streamers to open up the books. Uh, but the other one is where does the investment money come from? Uh, I think both Viviana and Seth, you can take this one. For films or for? For film. Our clients would be wherever they can find it. <laughs> um, I mean, there's there's private debt lenders such, such as us that exist out there. Um, and equity, I think, it seems to me from what I'm hearing, the equity is out there, but uh, the projects are difficult for them to recoup. So that's a bit of a barrier um, to entry for our business. M maybe Seth sees it differently. Yeah, I'd say capital uh, can definitely come from a variety of sources and really just depends on uh, how much capital at risk uh, someone is willing to put in and, and therefore uh, needing to lean on other co-financiers uh, to top up the rest of the capital to make a, a project a go project. And I think secondly, the, the other important metric or thought is that uh, the industry has changed such that um, you can you can sell a piece of content to a, an independent can sell a piece of content to a streamer at any point in time, whether it's at the start of production uh, or after a few dailies have come in and production has already started, or when production is wrapped, or when uh, when a production is tied up in a bow and ready to deliver. And at each of those points is similar to selling a stock. Uh, there's certain points where you can try to maximize returns. Uh, but it all is weighted on risk and return. There's some other questions in the chat box. I'm going to grab one real quick. Uh, the question is, what budget and genre of independent films do you think are most likely to be successful in today's market? Uh, simply referencing our deep database, I would say that it's the low budget films are most likely to break even. So I'm not saying it's the most successful because when we're talking about 10 poles, one can cover losses of many, one big uh, home run hit. But in terms of the ones where we see where cash on cash is breaks even as in, in is in profits, it was the lower budgets of 15, 20 million dollars or less for independent films and actually leaning towards the horror genre. That's been my experience. Uh, I don't know if you see otherwise stuff. Yeah, I'd say that uh, what you said is spot on. And one of the other big white spaces is uh, big budget sci-fi. It's really hard to, uh, I'd say, come by on, on streaming platforms. And therefore, there can be a significant amount of demand for it. So it all comes down to supply and demand and where the white space is. Mm. There's a question for you, Seth, out here. I don't know if you can address that one on the chat. Which question specifically? Uh, you mentioned, you mentioned in... alternative sources for comps and streaming. Can you ID those sources? 
Yeah, I'd, I'd say uh, sing, a, uh, pieces of fi figuring out the comps is coming from a variety of uh, sources. So budget, figuring out what, how much a movie costs can, and what the sale price is can come from uh, uh, just reading multiple different articles. So it really comes down to first IDing the content, seeing if it uh, it is a comp from from a budget, from a talent, from a genre perspective, and from a variety of other perspectives. And then from there, going in and figuring out uh, by researching and from talking to folks uh, what the budget was and what the sale price was. And yeah, so it's a combination. There's no specific source, unfortunately, but uh, yeah, just relying on. For me, it's relying on other executives within Anonymous who, who, uh, who may have that information and relying on peers. Well, in the, as we, in the interest of time and to respect uh, everybody's time, we will be wrapping up uh, the panel. Uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, the questions we didn't get to, uh, we can, uh, of course, uh, uh, address them offline. Uh, but uh, I would just like to thank everybody, the panelists, BHBA, all the participants, and you can reach uh, myself and Michael at ghjadvisors.com. Uh, all our contact information is there. And uh, I don't know if you wanted to do the same, Viviana and Seth. Yeah, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn or uh, just sbrody at anonymouscontent.com. Uh, likewise, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, my long name is here, but my email address is bzaragoitia at tpc.us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you.